Welcome to Fair Game, I'm Christine Leahy. For 25 years, my guest today kept a deep, dark secret from everyone he knew. Then, as he was about to begin his 13th year in the NBA, an incident caused him to see a ghost from his past. Now he's making a difference and raising awareness for mental health. Keon Dooling, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So you and I uh, were both with the Celtics at the same time. That's and right. I knew you a little bit. And then I left the team and I, I heard about this incident that happened on the court and it, it surprised me, it surprised everyone because we all knew you as this guy, um, stand-up guy, leader, and something, something happened. Yeah. And so I've really wanted to have this conversation with you for so many years, so I'm thankful for you coming on the show and doing this no, with me. thank you for having me. Um, if you guys don't cover this topic, we can never have these discussions, so thank you for having me. So I want to I want to get right into it. Um, for people who don't know, there was something that happened to you as a child. Right. The people who don't know, what what happened? So I was sexually abused at seven years old. Mm -hmm. um, that was one thing that happened to me. Also, I saw gunshots. My first gunfight that I saw was at 11 years old. Um, so I saw a lot of trauma early in my life. And the sexual abuse, a lot of times you hear it's from like a family member or yeah. an uncle. But for you, it was actually one of your peers, right? Yes, it was my brother's um, friend who was about 13 at the time. I was about seven. Um, but yeah, that's how it usually happens. It's usually somebody in your infrastructure, in your immediate space um, where you're vulnerable that takes advantage of you. I've read about the details of, of what happened and it's, it's traumatizing. It's, it's hard to even read it. But for you, how did that change your life? You're a kid and then this happens. I mean, you know, when you reflect, because I've had a lot of time in therapy to reflect, mm -hmm. um, I realized at a very early age, I was struggling with anxiety. Um, at certain points, I had uh, anger issues. Um, I was very promiscuous early in life as well. Um, so, you know, um, but I also started masking my pain very early. I started drinking very early. I started smoking very early. And so looking back on it, man, I was, um, man, I was in full uh, battle mode pretty much my entire life. And if I didn't have basketball and a support system like my family, um, I probably wouldn't have made it as far as I would, as I have. Um, because of the stigma that as a little boy that something happens to you, maybe you felt a little bit like you had to prove to yourself and to other people that you were a man. All the time. And so you had this chip on your shoulder. And do you almost feel like that made you who you were in the NBA and that that kind of helped you prove that you were this tough guy? I think at times you can channel from your anger, from the worst part of your journey, but I think you can burn out very quick if you're only going into a dark place to play. Um, the way that I played the game, I played it with fun, I played it with energy, I had, you know, from a place of joy. And so what I learned how to do later in my life is play it from a place of joy. I didn't have to necessarily channel uh, the environment that I grew up in or some of the traumatic experiences that I had. Oh, so it was an escape for you also. Absolutely. Basketball is a place where you can fully, you know, reinvent yourself. Um, it's a place where you can express, um, you know, uh, your dominance over your opponent. <laughs> um, it's a place also that I saw a way out. Um, you know, growing up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, it's tough, you know, and you know, my parents could not afford to send me to college and I knew I had to find a way to elevate myself and elevate my family and basketball was that outlet. So you're in the league for years and you kind of had this way to escape until one night you and I think it was Avery Bradley, yeah. you're out at dinner, mm -hmm. something happens in the bathroom that changes everything. Yeah. Was that? So um, we were at uh, out in Seattle, Washington. We did some charity work um, back in Avery's old neighborhood. As I go to use the restroom, a guy just, while I'm urinating, just grabs my butt. And um, it was the moment that really triggered me and shifted, you know, my entire life. It was, uh, yeah, it was a very, very life altering moment for me. Were there kind of memories that rushed back to you that you had suppressed for a while? Absolutely. I've never embraced um, my experience, especially around being sexually abused. It happened from a young man. I think sometimes um, as men, that's very difficult for us to grapple with. And so I was going to, you know, never tell anybody about that. I had never shared it with my wife, my family. Matter of fact, I never even allowed myself to feel what I had went through as a child. Um, and so in that moment, um, when these visions start coming back, these memories that I had pushed down, and there were more memories than just that one, but this one in particular was the most traumatic to me. Sure. So I kept trying to push it down and it kept coming back. And so I decided to run. 
run because I didn't know what I was experiencing at that moment. So that's when things kind of started to spiral oh, yeah. for you. Oh, yeah. I've talked to some of the Celtics who were there when you were too. Mm -hmm. um, you started coming to the practice facility and the guy that they knew wasn't there so much when you started doing this and you, you had kind of visions and hallucinations. What, what, what was that that was going on? So it was PTSD, undiagnosed, yeah. untreated. I think the thing with mental health is we don't have enough conversations, so we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so we get um, stigmatized or thrown away or alienated um, or forgotten about or put in a box that this guy is just crazy. I'm so thankful I was with the Celtics at that time um, and that they knew me and that they loved their players because a lot of teams could have backed away um, could have thrown me away and just, you know, allowed it to be another tragic story. But not the Celtics family. They pulled me in. Um, they were compassionate. Um, but also at the same time, I knew I was experiencing something. So I had to tell them, hey, I cannot play under these conditions. I'm experiencing something. I don't know what it is, but I just know I cannot play. You were talking at the time like things about like mind control and darkness and that people needed to get away from it. Do you remember that time, or is that kind of a blur? Yeah, I mean, I re there's things that are blur, but I definitely remember some of that. And um, when I was going through my PTSD, you know, a part of that is, you know, I talked about masking my pain, being promiscuous. And a lot of times when you're going through traumatic experiences like that, um, there, there's, th there's places where you've fallen short. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to deal with that. And, you know, um, though I was going through a battle with PTSD, I think I also was awakening um, who I was as a person and trying to do better and be better as a husband, as a father, as a friend. And um, just really, you know, just trying to, you know, grow from that moment. And you mentioned this, too, like a lot of teams, if a guy comes in and starts talking about those kinds of things or not acting within his character, they might just kind of push him aside or not really help, but the Celtics embraced you. That's right. Um, they didn't look at you like you were crazy. They looked at you like you really needed help. Absolutely. And you, how much did you feel that? I, I still feel it. Yeah. I still feel it. Um, Doc Rivers had a mantra for our team. It was called Mbutu, and I, I actually it. got it tatted on me. But it goes, in order for me to be all I can be, I need you to be all that you can be so that we can be all that we can be. And Doc and his little voice and his little, well, if you do this with the team and your family and your city and your county, we can make the world a better place. And um, the Celtics reflected that. Um, Doc Rivers, every day that I was in the mental institution, he was there. Every day that I was in the mental institution, Danny Ainge was at my house comforting my wife and my children. Um, every day that I was going through my battles, my teammates were there. And so that's a little bit about the, Cel the Celtics and their tradition and that character. So when you make the decision, all right, I gotta go talk to Danny. You, you felt comfortable talking to him at this point, saying you're gonna retire. What did he say to you? Oh, well, Danny, first of all, Danny looked at me with so much love and compassion, but also understanding and, re and respect in that moment. And so um, it was obvious that I was going through something. He said, hey, you don't have to retire. Maybe take some time off, maybe get some help. You know, maybe think this thing through a little bit, you know, and I was so tra I was so traumatized. Um, I didn't know I was experiencing PTSD. So I made a lot of those decisions from a very unhealthy place. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really realize that until I came out of the mental institution and got into therapy and started to reflect. A lot of times as athletes, we have to be so successful at every intersection in life, especially when you start from the bottom, that you don't get a chance to process your experience. You don't get a chance to process what you've uh, gone through and your, your journey. Sure. And so for the first time in my life, when I went to therapy, I was able to reflect.